Destination Africa, brought to you by Standard Bank. Still with us uh, in discussion is Alex van der Heerbe, independent health economist, and Fungai Chamba, head of Africa operations at Pharma Dynamics as well. And we're putting the spotlight on Africa's healthcare industry. Uh, Alex, let's pick up on where we left off ahead of the break. We were talking about the merits of a PPP as in the healthcare space and whether or not private sector is open to that method of funding and going down this route. Yeah, I think firstly to distinguish between uh, pure private and, uh, and, and govern, government initiatives to, to provide uh, effective coverage, the, 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 the public strategies essentially are the ones which require public-private partnerships and the public-private partnership typically involves quite an onerous contractual requirement from, from governments which, which often find difficulty in being able to manage the relationship if it deviates from a straightforward contract to just buy services. Mm -hmm. I would expect that it's, it would be improbable if, the, uh, if governments, it would be a loss of opportunity not to leverage off the evolving private sector because I expect it to evolve much more, much more rapidly than the public systems and develop a greater degree of sophistication. But the ev evolution of, public si of private systems that are unregulated is not always in the public interest and therefore it does require coherent government intervention to make sure that services are provided in a way that is not abusive to, yeah. to the public. But I would expect a mix of public-private arrangements. I would expect to evolve over the next 10 years regulatory regimes, mm -hmm. which is one way of maximising or optimising what you get for the general public out of a private system. And the other would be contractual opportunities, which would be there. Um, I would expect both to evolve. But the public-private partnership is specifically a measure that a public system tries to use to kind of uh, uh, improve the um, quality of what it gets. And the services that are out there. Of course, another element to consider from Guy is distribution and retail. And I came across quite an interesting fact that the retail sector, although significantly smaller, is the most profitable sector segment in the sector and has net margins of up to 50 percent uh, worth the estimated cost of investment of about 2.8 billion rand in your books the value proposition that investing in this space has i think that there's a huge opportunity uh, within the retail sector and in fact uh, uh, hospitals generally rely a lot on uh, you know the local retail uh, pharmacy uh, for medicines and so on uh, because they kind of work hand in hand. Uh, so there is a big opportunity uh, for getting into retail um, from a profitability point of view. Of course there's the opportunity that's there Alex. Uh, it takes the development though of distribution infrastructure, uh, you know warehouses, trucks, supply chain management and information systems as well and that would be the key to the success here. Challenges of going down this route and setting up shop within this space? Well, I think the developments that have occurred in South Africa to date can actually aid the region. A lot of the sophistication in distribution, information systems, relationships, electronic relationships between funders and providers have been set up in South Africa. The sy systems have been tested very well and are very reliable and are very useful mechanisms for um, uh, risk management on the side of hospitals, for instance, because they are absolutely sure they will be paid. Pharmacists are absolutely sure they will be paid. And, and that is uh, very important to, d to developing sustainability. That technology exists here. However, what might not exist in the region are the qualified people to, at this point in time to operate these systems, both within government, both at a regulatory s side and also just providing the services. Um, it's unclear whether or not they're producing enough qualified people, qualified pharmacists, qualified people in logistics, in finance and so on to, to grow at the rate that they must grow. But it may be that they, that they do actually uh, um, organically respond to the demand. Yeah. But that is where there's going to be a supply constraint in the medium term. And if they're not in place, it, it actually puts quite a bit of risk on many, particularly the providers. Yeah. yeah. Fungai, as an, uh, a player in this industry, I mean, uh, what, what's your sense of uh, the human resources that this sector has, uh, you know, has 
access to because many see it as a significant barrier to the growth of healthcare provision on the continent. Having said that, we've got Ghana, Senegal, Tanzania and Uganda uh, sitting with more open policies regarding the role of the private sector in the provision of medical education and uh, upskilling that sector of the economy. Yeah, I'd have to say that the numbers in terms of the health workforce that is out there are very, very small. Uh, and, you know, that's the, a lot of work I think needs to be done to create an environment where the, uh, that actual, you know, health provision space is attractive enough to, uh, uh, to uh, people that are qualifying either as doctors and pharmacists, etc. Uh, for them to in fact stay within that, uh, within, that, within that workspace. We find that there's a lot of brain drain of people that are moving to uh, more lucrative uh, countries, uh, certainly overseas and so on. Uh, and that just creates a lot more pressure on uh, you know, the lack of mm -hmm. that uh, human resource uh, um, uh, function. Uh, Alex, you mentioned that as one of the risks that the sector faces. A question that's also asked is whether Africa is culturally and economically receptive to modern medical treatment. Uh, if it is, how it will distribute that, uh, that medical treatment across the continent. Is there a business model that can actually execute and sustain distribution? I don't see that as a, as, a, as a sort of medium and long term constraint. I think that markets and countries tend to react naturally to this particular demand. And a lot of these countries are doing so. Their um, health outcomes, for instance, even through their public systems, are showing that they're reacting positively to the way they're running their countries, particularly the dem democratic countries in Africa. The undemocratic ones and the ones that are facing unrest and war and um, civil unrest face deteriorating circumstances as a consequence of that. But the countries with good governance show a completely different trend and in fact are improving faster than South Africa. And uh, so I would expect that, that they, it's likely that with an open um, style and approach to the developing of health systems, governments and, and, and dealing with the population, I would expect that there is going to be a natural response yeah. to, this, uh, to this particular market. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I think that that is really the, the key issue. A lot of these things just happen naturally. They do require a degree of government intervention and response, but provided your tertiary institutions are being developed, um, they, they will actually come together. And I, and I think that in terms of the technology on that side, a lot of South African companies are actually involved in the region, bringing what has been developed, very good quality systems. Yeah. And people, they actually are able to channel people from South Africa very, very, where there is actually a viable and sustainable demand into the region. What about costs of developing product at competitive prices? Because, uh, uh, you know, that's been cited as somewhat of a challenge and competition, especially, uh, or competing becomes especially difficult when you're competing against cheaper imports from the likes of China, for example. What's your assessment of that competitive landscape of the industry? I think that there will always be room for uh, a, a pricing continuum, if I can call it that. Uh, we do find that, generally speaking, um, there is a price sensitivity around uh, sub-Saharan sub African markets. But also you have a split between your target uh, market population, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whereas you have 75% of the people in the rural areas, you've got 20% that are, you know, uh, living in the cities, uh, and then, you know, your other 5% being your urban salaried uh, 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 workforce uh, type thing. That starts to talk to differential pricing, uh, which then means that there is a lot of space uh, and room for uh, a huge continuum of really your low-cost drugs to your yeah. very uh, um, high-cost branded uh, uh, product. Certainly here yeah, in South Africa, Alex, you know, in that move to low-cost drugs and getting that uh, access out there, you know, uh, we've had government here in South Africa advocate a state-owned pharmaceutical company. How do you see this uh, changing the playing field if it does materialize? Well, I, I think that there are a number of strategies to keep uh, medicine prices at um, affordable levels, at appropriately affordable levels and at fair pricing. The markets do get distorted 
quite easily, particularly when they're insured and the public needs to be protected in those instances. And to give one example from South Africa, a lot of our drugs in the private sector cost more than they do in Europe. So if that happens, it shows there's a distortion even in a regulated market. Now, uh, their markets are going to be vulnerable too. I think that a state supplier is just one type of solution. I think that there are also proposals for international benchmarking in South Africa and other ways of developing a sort of a fair market price and removing some of the price discrimination that occurs in the, in the market. Uh, I would not put much, um, I would not see a state provider of drugs as really being a major solution to the problems of that because it depends very much on how well the institution is run and we don't have a good record of that at the moment. Mm. It's far better to actually potentially regulate the market more effectively. You don't have to own it to get the prices at a reasonable price. You often know the market distortions that are causing these oh. problems. Um, I think that in cases where, where the European markets and the US and the industrialized countries are not investing in the kind of technology change in their drugs that actually are more relevant to the South African context and the regional context, I think that that's where you know, a degree of investment in, uh, in, in that side, innovation and, uh, and new drugs and production has a valuable role to play. Thank you, Alex and Fungai, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Of course, Sir Fungai Chamba is Head of Africa Operations over at Pharma Dynamics. He joined us from our studios in Cape Town. And Alex van der Heerwe is an independent health economist.